On July 4th, 1776, our founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence. On July 8th, they read the same declaration out loud to a congregation in Philadelphia and rang the Liberty Bell. It is said that the blessings we've received as a constitutional republic over the last 245 years are from God. Though it may not always seem like it at times, the turmoil seen in other countries proves the stability brought by God in America. An example of how our roots are based off Christianity can be found on our Liberty Bell. The inscription at the top of the bell is proclaim liberty to all the land and all the inhabitants thereof, Leviticus 25.10. John Adams said that the 4th of July would be one of our most memorable events for the United States of America. He also went on to say we shall celebrate the independence through acts of devotion to God. Before being elected, John F. Kennedy spoke at an Independence Day celebration in the city of Boston. Instead of speaking about political issues, Kennedy reminded the crowd that the informing spirit of America is based on religious principles. The 4th of July is a fun time to spend with friends and family. Most of you will be eating a delicious barbecue or watching the fireworks. As we are gathering with family this 4th of July, focus not just on our independence as a great nation, but also the religions that that got us there. Our founding fathers believe that our rights were given as a gift to us from God. Let me get us uh, set up right here, but I, I do want to say something before I start. Um, I, I firmly believe that the Lord has called us from being in bondage of sin. And yes, that is a word that is not often said anymore. We, we tend to focus on other things, but sin is a problem of the heart. Sin is a problem of human beings because we have chosen as human beings to stray, to stray away from God, right? But the Son of God came to give us freedom, freedom from sin because sin enslaves us. Sin will make you put you in bondage, and it will, that that you think is your freedom actually becomes a trap that will enslave you, that will limit your ability to enjoy the life that God has planned for you. And while I was sitting in, in my chair, I was thinking about some of us have been trying to be, to be free, have been fighting battles that we were not meant to fight alone. And this morning I was listening and reading the Word of God, and there are battles that you are never going to win on your own. And I have, I, have, I have a few words for you before I start and before I even pray. Whatever battle you're facing, whatever struggle you are dealing with, and you are not finding victory over it, let me remind you that the battle is the Lord's. Those battles are meant to be fought with the Lord. And some of these battles, you cannot find them on their own. You have to give them to God. It could be a child that is not walking with the Lord. It could be a spouse. It could be a financial problem. It could be a, a sickness that you have. My friends, the battle is the Lord's. So as we were singing the first song that we sang this morning, it had to do about him fighting our battles. And I said, you know what? I have to say it. I cannot start preaching without letting people know that whatever battle you're facing in unique victory, my friends, the battle is the Lord's. Amen. So as I am preaching, if you're going to give the Lord a hand, let's do it out loud. So this morning, as I am preaching and teaching, today's sermon is very patriotic. So I'm going to be reading quite a bit. There's, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, phrases in your outline. We're going to reflect upon the freedom and the, and the privilege of being Americans. But as I am preaching, I want the Holy Spirit to begin to work in every one of our hearts and let Him fix that that needs to be fixed, that that needs to be addressed. Amen. Would you stand in agreement with me and let us pray together so the Holy Spirit will do what He wants to do this morning and in this place. Amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you on this 4th of July. What an honor to be able to be ministering your word. And what an honor for this church people to be here in this sacred place. I ask you, Holy Spirit, 
that you will begin to move in our midst in a way that you have never moved before. Let your Holy Spirit, Father, become and minister to us. Jesus, we lift up your name. Jesus, we give you all the glory for what you have done for us on the cross. And we know that we are victorious because you have won the victory for us. This morning, Father, I release your spirit to do what it wants to do among us. And at the, at the end of this service, Father, we will be able to reflect upon the freedom and the liberty that we have because of what you've done for us. I thank you this morning in Jesus' name. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. So the message this morning is remembering the landmarks. I am very grateful to God because I'm an American citizen. See, maybe you were born in this country. I wasn't. I was born on the other side of the fence, okay? But in 1996, is anybody, if anybody needs an outline, the ushers will give you one at this time. But I was born on the other side of the fence. I always came and watched the Padres, came to Chula Vista Shopping Center. There was a store called the Broadway and Sears. That was our store. And we were from TJ, right? Two guys and Jemco. If you are San Diegan, you remember those stores. I'm dating myself. I know that. But Jemco and FedMart, does anybody remember those stores? Or am I the only one that's old enough to remember that? Remember FedMart, remember that? Two guys, remember those stores? Montgomery Ward, that was kind of a new, right? right? So I was from TJ, but there was something American about me. So in 1996, June 28th, 1996, I pledged allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and I became a U.S. citizen. Yeah, yeah. I became an American citizen by choice. And I kid you not, even to this day, I get teary-eyed. Like when my wife became an American citizen, dude, I'm, I'm sorry, not dude. I'm sorry, brothers. I was, I was crying because it's a big thing to become an American citizen. See, we take it for granted. I'm going to go a little freestyle here, okay? We take it for granted. What a blessing it is to be an American citizen. I have been to many countries in the world. My parents were missionaries. I've been to Mexico, everywhere in Mexico. And don't get me wrong, I know where my roots were. I know where I come from. But I know also very well where I am at right now. And let me tell you, I've been to Central America. I've been to South America. And there is no country like the good old U.S. of A. We have some freedoms that people paid a high price to be able to enjoy their privileges that we have today. See, people, our ancestors, like we were seeing in the videos, they had an understanding that we needed a nation that was different from any other nation in the world. And let me find my outline so I don't get sidetracked in here. But let me tell you, my friends, that we have privileges in this nation that some other people would die for them. Thank you, Nathan. Oh, this, yeah, this is mine. Yeah, 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 this is it. See, we have freedoms that other people in the other nations only dream of. In this country, we have privilege, for example, we have the privilege to disagree. We have the privilege to say and speak what is on our mind. You know that in some nations, people get killed and shot for speaking their mind? People do not have the freedom to say what they want to say. We have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom of expression. See, we have and we bestow our children with the, with the freedom to dream whatever they want to be. Don't we tell our kids, you can be whatever you want to be, right? That's a freedom because we are American citizens. On this Independence Day, I want to share with you the topic, remembering the landmarks. Remembering the landmarks. See, in the olden days, and the passage in your outline is Proverbs 22, 28. There's a, there's a verse that says, Do not move the ancient boundary which your fathers have set. What does this mean? And what are the landmarks we're going to talk about this morning? Back many, many hundreds of years ago, thousands of years ago, God gave the people of Israel a specific land. And what He did, He gave each of the 12 tribes, a special inheritance. God assigned the, the tribe of Reuben, of Judah, Levi, all those 12 tribes, certain territories to be their own. 
And what people did back then, they would literally set stones in the boundaries of that land so nobody could take their lands. They called them either stones or they would call them landmarks, okay? So if anybody tried to move those landmarks, which is what the Bible references in your outline tells us, you cannot move those landmarks. Because the moment you moved that landmark of those stones, you were breaking the covenant. You were breaking, you were transgressing what God had given to those people. Nowadays, we have the same problem. Maybe not so much in the sense of territory, but there are some spiritual landmarks that this nation was based upon that have been moved, and you can see them. You can see that our country is struggling right now with some of those landmarks that were sacred and they were in the mind of our founding fathers because they wanted something different than any other nations in the face of the earth. We have values and spiritual landmarks that were at the core of this country's foundation. We are living now, my friends, in difficult times. All you have to do is turn on the TV. I know most of us don't watch TV anymore. But we are in social media. But when you turn on the news, and yes, I am old school. I still watch the news. I only see difficult things happening. I see challenging times ahead of us. So this morning, as we celebrate the 4th of July, as we celebrate the freedoms that God has granted us by simply living in this nation. And yes, I said it. Simply living in this nation. We have to remember that we have to hold steadfastly those landmarks that have made us such a blessing for the entire world. What are some of those landmarks that we must maintain in America? Well, the first ones that I want to share is liberty and sacrifice. And I'm going to take my watch because it keeps beeping. And I just got that watch and I don't know how to use it. It's an Apple watch. I, uh, I, I love it. I love it when I'm working, but I'm not working right now, and it just keeps beeping. And I don't know how to turn it off up here. Liberty and sacrifice. Look at this, look at this quote that is right there in your outline. Temptation is to enjoy the fruits of citizenship without tending the tree of liberty. It saddens me to say but most of us here have not earned the freedom that we enjoy in this country. The truth is very people understand what it means to really shed blood, sweat, and tears for the freedoms we have in the USA. I always wanted my children to go into the military. I didn't go to the military. I didn't have a chance to do it. But I've always wanted someone in my family to go to the military. Miguel, you still have a chance. You're still young. Because I really value the freedoms that we have. I mean, I grew up, like I told you, I grew up in Mexico. And I grew up in a, in a decent place, in a decent household, good schools. I really didn't face, but I know that the world needs people like the USA. People that come from this country that we value freedom and democracy and all those things. But my friends, in this country, we enjoy our freedoms. We enjoy the liberty that we have. Don't you enjoy it, really? But liberty comes with sacrifice. Look at this poem. It says, we eat. I think this poem defines clearly what this freedom, what this liberty means, and, and what sacrifice means. I think it's in your outline. It says, we eat from orchards we did not plant. We drink from wells we did not dig. We reap from fields we did not sow. Fires we did not kindle warm us. Roofs we did not build shelter us. We are blessed by money we did not give. The moment we move those landmarks of liberty and sacrifice, we will forfeit our commitment to tend to the tree of liberty by ignoring our duty to self-sacrifice and to serve this nation of ours. There's a phrase, and I, I don't know if it was John Kennedy that said it, and it's, it's not in my notes, so I'm I'm going to try to remember it. It's do not ask what this country can do for you, but ask what you can do for this country, right? See, that's the thing. That's the mentality. That's why we have the nation that we have nowadays. And you may say, well, I disagree with this. And well, yeah, that is a privilege. 
that somebody pay so you can have the freedom to disagree? Because we are blessed beyond our understanding. All we have to do is take a peek at the other nations in the world and say, you know what? The liberty and the sacrifice that we have in this place, it truly is a blessing. That boundaries, that landmark of liberty and sacrifice has to be kept alive every single day of our lives. John Adams, as he signed the Declaration of Independence, he said, whether we live or die, sink or swim, succeed or fail, I stand behind this Declaration of Independence, and if God wills it, I am ready to die in order that this country might experience freedom. That level of patriotism fueled this man, all these people that risked their lives when they were signing the document to face off against the most powerful nation in the world at that time. And they did it so you and I can live in the land of the free and the home of the brave. So we can go to the ballpark and get up in the, in the seventh inning or we can get up in the beginning of the game and we can sing the Star Spangled Banner. Somebody had to pay the price of sacrifice so we can have liberty. Let me ask you one thing. Is the world better because of who you are as a citizen? Is the community and the church and the family that you belong to better because you are a true American citizen? Or are you not taking care of the tree of liberty? Peter Marshall, before the U.S. Senate, said in his prayer, Lord, help us to see that our liberty is not the right to do as we please, but the opportunity to please to do what is right. We have to do what is right. Are we okay, my friends? Are we following along? Amen. Landmark number two, capitalism and conscience. Capitalism and conscience. And I know that some of you may think, well, what does capitalism have to do with a church, right? What does that have to do with a church? When the founding fathers were creating a form of government, and I am reading, it says they were convinced that there was a higher power that involved the destinies of every person in the nation. They believed that all men were given abilities by their creator with certain rights, and among those rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There was a moral backbone that gave structure to the young nation. We all agree upon that, correct? But let's fast forward almost 250 years, and we can tell that something is off. Something is not working the way our founding fathers intended for this nation to operate. We are seeing right now that greed and materialism are ruling our society. We are seeing capitalism without a conscience. We are seeing a capitalism that puts, first and foremost, personal gain. So what am I talking about right here? Why is this important on this 4th of July? Because God intends for people to have the freedom to work hard and earn a living in an honest way that benefits and that rewards people that are committed and that are loyal to what they're doing. Do you agree? If you do, say amen. amen. If you work hard, you want to be paid a fair wage and make an honest living, right? I don't go to work for free. If you do, I commend you. I don't, okay? I go to work because I want to make an honest living. And when, at the end of the week, or at the end of the month, I get paid, believe it or not, I get paid once a month. That's it. Took discipline to change some behaviors. For 30 years, I've been paying bi-weekly. But now I get paid once a month. But I want to go to work knowing that on the 25th, my company is going to deposit every 30 days. Right? Capitalism has the ability to give you the freedom to have a free market where you can grow and you can prosper and you can be blessed. What's the problem? What is the landmark that has been moved that I'm trying to create awareness this morning? We have a sense of capitalism that abuses people for personal gain. We have a form of economy sometimes 
that it was not the intent of our founding fathers that sees people as objects, as a number, as a stat, more than individuals. Capitalism and conscience, listen, allows us to create a free market. It should allow us to work hard and make an honest living because we promote entrepreneurial spirit, correct? Now, capitalism without a conscience becomes cruel and ruthless. And we've seen this not only in our country, we've seen it in other places in the world. I know countries where there's people in the lower bottom of the economic strata that will never be able to go to the next level, that will never be able to break out of poverty. They, will, they are born and they will die being poor, not having the freedoms and the liberties and what we enjoy as Americans. We, we have to be able to see that we cannot allow our country to go down that path. We have to be steadfast and promote capitalism with a conscience. My friends, this morning, as we celebrate the 4th of July, I encourage you, go after your dreams. Go after, set goals. I mean, how many young people, I see a lot of young people here. What are your goals? You have, as an American, you have a freedom to, to, to chase your dream, to set a goal and say, I'm going to make it happen. Because we, will have, to, we have to promote capitalism with a conscience. Now, let me, let me give you a warning here. Whatever business you do, treat people fairly. Young people, older people, whatever business you do, treat people fairly. I believe that we should treat people as if they were our family members. I tell my customers, because I deal with customers, and I, I literally, this is what I do. We're talking about a business proposition, and then I step aside and I go, if I was your brother if, or if I was your cousin, this is what I would do. And I step aside from being a salesman and I become a consultant. And I tell them, if you were my cousin, and I literally say it, you know, if I would do this instead. So what am I doing? I am having a conscience because I want my business to grow. I want to sell, sell, sell but not at the sake that I'm going to affect my customer because I'm developing, I'm giving you sales skills this morning, because I'm developing a customer for life. See, I don't want to make a $50,000 sale in one shot and never see my customer again. I'd rather sell them $100,000, $1,000 every couple of weeks. Does that make sense? Did I lose you? No. Okay, we're good, right? That is capitalism with a conscience. I'm thinking not only in my, for my benefit, but for the benefit of those people that are around me. Believe it or not, that is one of those landmarks that we need to watch for as Christians, as an American. Amen? Number three, religious freedom and commitment. Religious freedom and commitment. Those are the landmarks of religious freedom and commitment. Since the inception of this country, people were given the freedom to worship without the burden of a state imposing its views. Every American has the freedom to worship God without the state imposing its views, without the state telling you what you have to do. We have been given that right, first of all, by our Creator but now also in the Constitution. We have, though, a society that has deviated from this God-given right. It saddens me to say this morning that America has become unchurched. There's a lot of spiritual people out there, but people that are now not within the framework of God's intent, which is a church. Now, you tell me if you haven't heard of this. Well, I love God, or I like God, or I believe in God. I just don't like organized religion. Have you ever heard that? I just don't like the church. Let me be, let me antagonize a little bit. When you serve God and you love God, you are put into a family of God. When a baby is born, 
When you love someone, you do it within the context of a family. Right or wrong? See, there's, for example, uh, I don't know, uh, your, your daughters. Your daughters will flourish and thrive in the context of your family. Because you, you father them, you gave birth to them, but that's not it. They need to develop and grow, right? See, when the founding fathers set the landmarks of religious freedom, okay, and commitment, people misunderstood this and did whatever they wanted to do, which is their, their right. But the way this really should work is that we should have a body of Christ, a family, where you grow and you develop into everything that God wants you to be. See, you have a purpose. The fact alone that you are standing, you are in this place, sitting in your seats this morning, is because God has a purpose for you. This is not an accident. God has a plan for everything. Even those defeats, even those battles, even those setbacks in your life, God has a purpose. We as a nation have to be able to communicate and set the landmark that we have religious freedom and we have a commitment. But the problem in America today is that we have no commitment to worshiping God. We have forgotten that our commitment to God should be a result and the gratitude of all the blessings that God has given us. See, we are looking away from one of the greatest freedoms that we have that is to worship God in the context of a church. Many people, many people around the face of the earth, I can tell you one nation alone that I've heard many testimonies, China. For many years, they were the biggest, not the biggest in terms of population, the biggest nation in the world. Many of those people died and gave their lives because they wanted to have religious freedom. And here in America, we take it for granted and we go to church maybe once or twice a year. Wow, not a lot of amens. Good job, Pastor Juan. Good, keep, keep, keep preaching. Good job. It is in this context where we raise our children to be everything they can be. Isn't there a slogan? I think, be all you can be. Isn't that the army? What's the name? Be all you can be. Okay. God's desire is for you to be all that you can be. When I see children, our new visitor this morning, God wants us to be all that we can be. He wants your daughters to be all that they can be. And can I tell you one thing? This, this right here is the best context. Our children learn in, in, with all these people, with this big church, to communicate, to speak, to connect with other people. But if you take that context of the church and you think you can, you can worship God and join, and you can, and you can, you can worship God anywhere because God is everywhere. Yes, I agree. But it always works better in the context of people who worship God together. You can stay home and you can watch us online. And we love you. Bless you. Thank you. Right? But there's this place is a sacred place because the moment we walk in, God decides to honor the promise that he was going to be there when two, one, when two or more joined in his name to praise him. So whether you feel him or not, I know that he is here. And I know he's the one that sometimes when we're singing those songs, he's the one telling you, hey, I am with you. I am fighting for you. That happens only in the context of those freedoms that we have been given to gather as people of God. Let us not forget the landmark of religious freedom and commitment. Number four, and I'm almost wrapping up. Anybody has a hundred dollar bill I can borrow? No? <laughs> no? Number four, God and trust. God and trust. Okay, you guys aren't cooperating. I'm going to take out my, I don't have a hundred, but I do have a 20. God, oh, <laughs> Tell
tell me this is not the most beautiful bill in the world. <laughs> right, right. Tell me, tell me it isn't the most beautiful bill in the world. It is the most beautiful bill in the world. I love hundreds. And the new ones are so beautiful. What's on one common denominator in our currency? Tell me. Yes, sir. In God we trust. Haven't, haven't we been the beacon of light for the entire world for almost 250 years? Have we or have we not? Please. Yes. Should be a resounding yes. 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 It's no accident. I... Oh, it's time? Okay. All right. Yeah, I'm, I'm just going to keep going, okay? You, you do whatever you have to do back there. It's all good. We have been a blessing to many nations in the world. No other nation like America goes out to Haiti, to Mexico, to Africa with planes full of food, medicine, doctors. God, we want to keep trusting you for the next 250 years. It saddens me that we have tried to put God aside because we are misguided. Take it, because I'm going to keep it otherwise. There you go. Thank you. Let's give, it, let's give this one, a warm hand to this young man. Thank you. God has blessed the USA because we are a country that in our money we say, in God we trust. This country was founded on biblical principles that honor God. It doesn't matter how prosperous we become, though. The moment we forget about God, we run the chance of losing everything everything we may be rich financially but may be bankrupt when it comes to relationship and family and life see nowadays the goals are success status and security and in the process some of us have forgotten god some of us run the chance of missing out on the best that god has for us just let me bring awareness to this right now we are seeing that riches have replaced righteousness, that science has replaced Christ, that liberty has turned into licentiousness and right into reckless behavior. In 1940, teachers had problems like talking with students, gum chewing, making noise, running in the halls, but in the 90s and even today, we are seeing problems with drug abuse, alcohol, pregnancy, suicide, rape, assault. Not so long ago, you remember perhaps, somebody decided that we should not say under God anymore. You remember that? To take under God off from the Pledge of Allegiance. My friends, we cannot allow that to happen. We have to stand firm on the landmark of God and trust. I'm going to close this morning with the passage that is in your outline from Deuteronomy 8, 7 to 14. See, this is not the first time that on the face of the earth, God has turned his face toward the nation. It happened before, and it happened with the people of Israel. But I believe that God also turned his face towards America so I am going to use this passage and I'm going to apply it to us as a nation. Please follow along. For the Lord your God, verse 7, is bringing you into a good land, a land of streams of water, of fountains and springs flowing out in valleys and hills. And, and doesn't this sound like America? A land of wheat and barley, of vines, fig trees, pomegranates, a land of olive oil and honey, a land where you will eat food without shortage, in which you will not lack anything, a land whose stones are iron and out of those hills 
you can dig copper. When you have eaten and are satisfied, you shall bless the Lord your God for the good land which he has given you. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God by failing to keep his commandments, his ordinances, his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Otherwise, when you eat and are satisfied and you build good houses and live in them, and when your herds and your flocks increase and your silver and gold increase and everything that you have increases, then your heart will become proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. My friends, I have brought attention to you this morning to remembering the landmarks which have made us a great nation. Thomas Jefferson said, or penned actually, when the landmark has been correctly placed and it has been proven to be right, don't move it. Patriotism is not a short and frenzied burst of emotion, but the long and steady dedication of a lifetime. Please stand up this morning. I have shared with you some of the landmarks that have been in place for close to 250 years. Liberty and sacrifice, capitalism and conscience, religious freedom and commitment, God and trust. My prayer this morning, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is that we will always be grateful, young people, that we will always be grateful for God and the opportunities we have in this nation that we not take our citizenship lightly so that the generations that are coming after us will follow us and enjoy what God has given us today. Amen. Amen. Don't you want the best for your families, for your children? Amen. Let's not forget the landmarks which have made us the number one country in the world. Amen. Why don't we pray together? Father, we thank you. Thank you for America. Thank you for allowing us to be in this nation. And if we are citizens, thank you for the freedoms that we have. And those perhaps that are on the path to becoming citizens, thank you, Lord, for we welcome them. Father, we, we just pray this morning that you will keep us sensitive to that which has made us the, the blessed nation that we are. And as we go along to celebrate this 4th of July, that we can see the food, the colors, and everything and be grateful for what you have done for us. We worship you, we thank you, and I bless everyone that is in this place, Father, that we will think about this sermon, that we will talk about it and put it into practice, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let me remind you, when you leave, please say hi to somebody, shake their hands, and also, if you go to the main campus, there's a whole aisle, There's, I mean, there's a ton of hot dogs, and chips and soda. Please join us. We want to see you there. God bless you. Have a great 4th of July.